It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On March 24th, the Premier said, quote, when I say I'm going to cooperate and have been cooperating with authorities, I'm talking about the authorities whose responsibility to conduct the investigation. Mr. Speaker, when the Premier says that she's going to cooperate with authorities, does that include the criminal court assigned to the corruption charges against her key fundraiser? Mr. Speaker, will the Premier agree to testify if subpoenaed to the trial of Jerry Lawhey Jr.? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, this is an issue that I have taken very seriously. Uh, because I take it seriously, Mr. Speaker, I have, uh, I have cooperated with all of the authorities. I have cooperated in the investigations, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, we've, uh, I've been very open with the legislature, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, I've answered 96 questions. I've uh, heard enough, and it'll stop. I've answered 96 questions on, uh, on this issue in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. I've, uh, I've made dozens of statements uh, in the media and answered questions in the media. I have cooperated with the authorities, Mr. Speaker. I will continue to cooperate with the authorities, as we all have. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again for the Premier, the Premier has told the legislature 40 times that she will cooperate with authorities during the Sudbury investigation. In fact, on February 26, the Premier said that she would fully cooperate and work with authorities. The official opposition respects the fact the Premier met with OPP investigators, but her duty is to clear the, to clear the air, and that, that hasn't been done. The people of Ontario deserve to know who ordered Jerry Lawhey to make the phone call and offer the alleged bribe. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, Absolutely. Is, is the Premier prepared, and this is very clear, is the Premier prepared to appear before the court and answer those questions? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I have said, I have answered all of the questions that have been asked of me. I have uh, answered 96 questions in the House, Mr. Speaker. And if past behaviour is indicative of future behaviour, and I have cooperated with the authorities, I've worked with the authorities, Mr. Speaker, have cooperated with the investigation, I will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, this is as, as clear as mud. Again, to the Premier, we know the Premier has the parliamentary privilege, privilege to be exempted as a witness. However, the privilege is not meant to impede the course of justice. Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario deserve to know what really happened with the Sudbury by-election scandal. So I'm sure the people of Ontario want the Premier not to waive that privilege and appear of call to the trial. Mr. Speaker, yes or no, will the Premier testify, if subpoenaed, to the corruption trial of her key fundraiser? Thank you. I, uh, I am standing. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have not attempted to avoid answering questions that have been posed to me here, that have been posed to me by the, the Member for Prince Edward that have been posed to me by the authorities. I have worked with the, the investigation. I have cooperated fully, Mr. Speaker. The member from I will from continue to cooperate fully. The member and from Leeds fact, Grenville. Mr. Speaker, unprompted, I have made statements in public about the situation in Sudbury. So I will continue to cooperate, Mr. Speaker. I will continue to. Respond to requests uh, by the authorities, as I have done, Mr. Speaker. That behaviour is not going to change. Thank you. Good question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, when questioned about health cuts, the Liberal government refused to take responsibility. This year, the Canada health transfer increased by $652 million. The Liberals shifted $52 million, $54 million away from this transfer maybe to a different ministry, or maybe to cover up another one of their scandals. No one knows which one it is, Mr. Speaker, because the Liberal government refuses to even acknowledge the $54 million cut to health care. Deputy the House Leader. To cut $54 million was the wrong decision. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier admit she cut $54 million from health care from the front lines at exactly the wrong time? Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, I know that 
think the Minister of Health is going to want to uh, comment on this, but let me let me just go over what has been going on in uh, health in terms of the uh, the big picture in Ontario. Since 2003, hospital funding in Ontario has risen from 11.3 billion dollars to 17.3 billion dollars this year. That's a 53 percent increase, Mr. Speaker. This year, the health care budget is 50.8 billion dollars. Wow. Mr. Speaker, we committed to a 5% increase in home and community care and, uh, investments, which will grow over $750 million over the next three years. Funding for community support services increased to almost $514 million this year, Mr. Speaker. That's an increase of $41.9 million over last year, Mr. Speaker. The fact is there are 24,000 more nurses in Ontario than there were in 2003, Mr. Speaker. The number of physicians has increased to over 5 1,600 has increased by 5,600, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again for the Premier, these cuts are hurting people across the province. And at the CCACs in my own riding, last year a 74-year-old Simcoe County woman who was nearly blind and had below the knee amputation had twice daily visits by a PSW to help her bathe and deal with these developing sores. When her husband died last summer, the CCAC cut her evening support. Shortly after that, she was notified she would lose her morning visit as well. At that point, she began developing sores. She couldn't reach the sores to treat them herself. Her services were restored, but only after she hired a private patient advocate. Mr. Speaker, where is the Premier's compassion? Does she believe patients should only have to pay Question. out of pocket for the, to get the services restored, to hire a private contractor to fight for their services? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Notwithstanding the fact that that party, the party opposite, voted against our increase of $250 million annually to home and community care for each of the next three years, the leader of the opposition has a chance to redeem himself and redeem his party by chance? supporting, and I think he will, just given the nature of his uh, question, supporting our 10-point plan that we announced yeah. earlier this year, this yeah. spring, in fact, of important changes to make to our home and community care sector. Alongside that increase in funding, it was a 10-point plan that implements in full the results of an expert panel laid, uh, le uh, led by the esteemed Gail Donner to uh, help us make sure that the quality of services that we provide is the best that c it can possibly be. So I asked the member opposite, I asked the leader of the yes, official sir. opposition, will he support our 10-point plan, our action plan to improve home and community care across this province? Mr. Speaker, my question is again for the Premier. Last Friday, we celebrated the Day of Francophonie. In my riding of Simcoe North, the government is closing the Penetanguishing Hospital. This government is turning its back to communities like Penetanguishing. Fifty residence positions have been cut, and this is when 8,000 Ontarians need a family doctor. At the same time, this government is cutting $54 million in the health care budget. It's enough. Mr. Speaker, when will our Premier protect the Francophone Hospital in Penetanguishan? Okay. The Premier? Minister of Health. The Minister of Attorney General. Francophone Affairs. Francophone Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an excellent question, question that's been asked. I'm very much aware of what's happening at the Georgian Bay General Hospital and its location in Penetanguishan. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has said the Penetanguishan site will not close its door while the Francophone services are not transferred to the Georgian Bay General Hospital. So, the Lins of North Simcoe, during their planning for Francophone healthcare services, are doing are very satisfied with the services at Georgian Bay. And I would like to recognize the Minister of Health, who responded quickly to ensure that services will be maintained in the new Georgian Bay Hospital. So, thank you to the Minister.
The question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians are growing increasingly cynical about this Liberal government and politics. It's no wonder, considering that the, Liber uh, the uh, Sudbury bribery scandal and people's disbelief that this Premier could actually sell off Hydro One without any public consultation Deputy whatsoever. Deputy House Leader, second time. Despite the condescending lectures of the government House Leader yesterday, there is nothing that says that the Premier couldn't stand in this place and accept some responsibility for her role and the role of her office in the Sudbury bribery scandal. Will this Premier, Premier finally take some responsibility and tell Ontarians who gave the order for Mr. Lougheed to offer a bribe to Mr. Olivier? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I, uh, I said to the leader of the third party yesterday, um, I have uh, I have spoken on this issue. I have answered questions in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, between February 17th uh, and April 2nd, Mr. Speaker, and including questions in the House uh, this month, Mr. Speaker. I've answered 96 questions. All of that is on answered, Mr. Speaker. It's quite clear uh, what my uh, what my position has been. I've made statements in the media unprompted, Mr. Speaker. So I'm not going to preempt the process that is now before the courts, and uh, I think the leader of the third party knows full well that it would be inappropriate of me to do so. Thank you. Because the Premier is right about one thing. This place isn't a court where she would have to answer to a judge. This is the Ontario Legislature, and in this place, she's supposed to answer to the people of Ontario. wonder that people are becoming more and more cynical about politics if it takes being sworn in by a judge to actually get some honesty around here. Now, will this Premier finally take some responsibility and tell Ontarians whether she, Ms. Sorbera, or someone else in her office instructed Mr. Lawhey to offer a bribe? Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have been completely honest with the people of Ontario. Yeah, right. I have been very clear about repeatedly in the House. I have made statements in the media. I have responded to questions in the media, Mr. Speaker. I have cooperated with the authorities. I will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, but this is not the court of law, and I am not going to preempt that process. There is an issue that is before the courts, and we have to let that process unfold, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker, the Premier has had opportunities to show leadership. She has had opportunities to accept responsibility for her actions and the actions of people around her. But at every opportunity, she has refused and instead protected Liberal insiders, dragging the reputation of the office of the Premier of Ontario through the mud, Speaker, and increasing that sense of cynicism. Minister of Economic Development. That sense of cynicism that so many Ontarians are feeling about their government. If the Premier and her office have nothing to hide in the Sudbury bribery scandal, then why won't she put cynical politics aside, tell Ontarians who was it that directed Mr. Lougheed to offer Mr. Olivier a bribe in Sudbury? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the questions that uh, the leader of the third party are putting forward are questions that uh, that will, I'm no doubt, be asked in uh, in the court. I'm not going to preempt that process or presume to know what those questions will be, Mr. Speaker. I have cooperated with the authorities. I will continue to do that. I think, Mr. Speaker, that it is extremely important that everyone understand that we are engaged as government in making very difficult decisions in implementing a plan, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that is going to build this province up, that is already building the province up, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party can laugh because she actually doesn't support investments in transit and transportation infrastructure. She actually doesn't support making a business environment that allows businesses to thrive, Mr. Speaker. She has opposed all of the actions that we have yes, taken, Mr. Speaker, and will continue to take to make sure that this province is competitive and that our economy can grow, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated. Thank you. Nope. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, second time. New question. The leader of the third party. 
My next question is also for the Premier. Over the summer, I was in every corner of this province, Speaker. I spoke to New Democrats, I spoke to Liberals, and I spoke to Conservatives, and I spoke to people who have no partisan interests whatsoever, Speaker. They all told Order. me the exact same thing. They are frustrated, they are worried, and they are angry that this Premier is selling off Hydro One without ever, ever consulting them, Speaker. They are growing cynical. They are growing cynical about a government that simply will not listen. Will this Premier address the concerns that people are raising and hold public hearings on the sell-off of Hydro One, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, I understand that it is in uh, that this leader of the third party perceives that it is in her political interest to make sure that she stirs up any concerns that people might have. I understand that that is in her best interest as she perceives it. Some might say that is cynical, Mr. Speaker. Some might say that it is cynical that when people raise concerns, because I know, Mr. Speaker, I traveled the province, I was in every corner of the province, Mr. Speaker, and I know, no, I know that there are concerns. But, Mr. Speaker, it is my responsibility, and I would suggest it's all of our responsibility, to tell the whole story, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that people understand that the decision that our government has taken is about investing in this province for a brighter future, a more prosperous future, a more competitive future. That's what the decision is. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, what about the 82 per cent of people who do not want to see hydro pipes sold off? And think these Liberals should listen to what Ontarians have to say. Yesterday, yesterday Speaker, we heard that 165 municipalities so far oppose the Liberal sell-off of Trinity hydro Spadina. One of their biggest complaints, Speaker, is the utter lack of any consultation whatsoever by this arrogant Premier. Sarnia Mayor Mike Bradley said that you would have to actually be Sherlock Holmes to fi figure out that the Liberal pre-election budget was talking about selling off Ontario's hydro utility. The Premier needs to listen, and if she won't listen to me, then she should be listening to the municipal leaders and the people of this this province who are telling her that they have a to say and that they want to say. So, will this Premier allow public hearings, either through the OEB or through any other mechanism, on the sell-off of Hydro One? So, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm glad that the, uh, the leader of the third party raised the uh, commentary that was made by the Minister of uh, or the Mayor of Sarnia yesterday because, Mr. Speaker, I have the opportunity to attend the uh, Chamber of Commerce in uh, in Sarnia, Mr. Speaker. I had not. A member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, second time. Finish, please. It was a great opportunity. I think it was one of the first times that a premier had actually uh, been in recent memory had been to uh, to speak with the, the businesses in Sarnia, Mr. Speaker. It was a great meeting. I had an opportunity to have a tour. But, Mr. Speaker, I will tell you. The number one issue that the mayor of Sarnia raised with me was the building of a road, Mr. Speaker. The mayor of Sarnia wants money for infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. The mayor of Sarnia knows that his and his community's productivity and competitiveness rests on having investments in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party needs to flesh out her story when she's talking. Be seated, please. Okay. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's no wonder that the people of Ontario are growing increasingly cynical about this government, considering the uh, display we just saw. The cancellation of the gas plant, Speaker, eHealth, 
Orange, deleted public records, the Sudbury bribery scandal, and now the sell-off of Hydro One. It's easy to understand how Ontarians have become so cynical, but it is bad for democracy, Speaker. The Premier has said that she wants to do things differently. Well, I would submit that it certainly is not too late. Will this Premier start actually doing things differently, start trying to regain the public confidence and hold public hearings before she sells off the first tranche of shares of Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, as I have said many times, uh, a couple of things. This was a very difficult decision, but the fact is that we must make those investments, including in infrastructure in Sarnia and in every part of the province, Hamilton, Kitchener-Waterloo, Northwestern Ontario, Remember from Lanark, all from Norton, communities second time. that are looking for investment in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We made it clear in our budget, Mr. Speaker, in our platform, Mr. Speaker, that we were looking at assets and that we were looking at leveraging those assets so that we could invest in the new assets that we need for the 21st century, Mr. Speaker. And it was clear to people, it was even clear to the leader of the third party that we were actually looking at those assets, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, the leader of the third party on July 6 of 2014 said, the budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown Corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. She understood it, Mr. Speaker. A few new questions. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, today the halls of Queen's Park are filled with the most accessible health care provider in Ontario, Absolutely. our pharmacists. Here, here. Unfortunately, these health care professionals have been an easy target for cuts from this government for the past 12 years, and October 1st is no exception. With your cut in nursing positions throughout the province, your $235 million cut to doctors, pharmacists will see a $150 million cut to their profession. Wow. However, due to the accessibility of the pharmacists, the government should be utilizing the abilities of the pharmacists to derive immediate cost savings in the health care system, such as implementing expanded ejection authority, expanding smoking cessation programs, and enabling pharmacists to treat minor common ailments. Minister, why do you ignore the expanded scope of practice for pharmacists? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know my critic is new at the job, but I would have hoped, given his background, he would know that we have dramatically expanded the scope of practice for our pharmacists across this province, as we should. And very shortly, later in the next month, in October, our pharmacists are going to join us in vaccinating probably, I anticipate, upwards of one million Ontarians against flu by administering the flu vaccine in our pharmacies. It's a wonderful example of increasing scope of practice, yeah, but also utilizing our pharmacists to the fullest extent. These are individuals that have such great capacity and are such an integral part of our health care system. We're constantly looking for ways that we can take advantage of their expertise, take advantage of their presence in our communities, and take advantage of the fact that they have the trust of our communities and the people that live there to make sure that we provide that quality health service. Yeah. Thank you. Speaker, Speaker uh, back to the Minister of Health. Minister, I've been a pharmacist for 20 years and have been proud of my profession. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, to just exemplify that pharmacists can only do flu shots is absolutely ridiculous. If you listen to my first question, it's an expansion of vaccinations across the board. However, hopefully you can listen to my supplemental and come up with a better response to the pharmacists that are here today. Your government seems to have money to pay out bonuses for Pan Am games. Yep. And according to the Auditor General, have money to create large bureaucracies in the health care systems. Yep. However, you're continuing to cut frontline health services to the detriment of Ontario's. Pharmacists have proven to create immediate savings in health care system while increasing services. Yeah, yeah. Other provinces have implemented expanded injection authority for pharmacists, expanding smoking cessation programs, and other provinces have enabled pharmacists to treat minor common First ailments. Time. All of which would create immediate savings in the health care system. Minister, why are you so Order. focused on paying the salaries and bonuses of health care bureaucracy you. while you wage a war with. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. 
Minister of Health. Oh, Mr. Speaker, and to the member opposite, I didn't raise the issue of expanded access to further injectable vaccines because, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to leave the best for last. So I announced a number of months ago, in fact, it was in our budget that we are expanding the scope of our pharmacists even further to be able to enable them to provide travel vaccinations, potentially other vaccinations as well. So you voted against that budget, but it was there in black and white. I made the announcement a number of months ago as well. We Excuse me. Minister of Natural Resources. Member from Halliburton. Thank you. Finish, please. So I would just invite the member opposite to come to the reception tonight, hear from pharmacists and from the OPA how much they are celebrating the fact that we're increasing the scope. We've created a table to look at further injectables, and we are we are moving forward in a way that I think if you actually talk to pharmacists, they'll agree with you. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy tried once again to claim he has a public mandate to sell Hydro One. To reporters, he said that before the elections, quote, we talked about repurposing assets without being specific. He said, quote, there's no government that is ever elected that abides by every single detail of an election platform. The principle was in the election platform. The specifics were in the budget. 166 municipalities now, including Peterborough, and more than 80 per cent of Ontarians believe that the sale of Hydro One is more than just a detail. Since your minister now agrees that the sale of Hydro One was not specifically mentioned in her election platform, will the Premier finally Question. admit she has no public mandate? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we know that the NDP, the third party, has been crisscrossing the province, telling everybody that rates will skyrocket because Hydro One is going to broaden its ownership, Mr. Don't Speaker. Have faith in the, rea the reality, Mr. Speaker, that is not the case. Last week, the member from the P in Carleton is warned, and I'm going to remind everyone to use titles or writing names. It does not elevate the debate, it lowers it. Finish, please. They've been telling everybody the sky is falling in. Hydro rates are going to skyrocket, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, last week the Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that the Ontario Energy Board has the authority to control rates, to, to reverse rates, not to give requested increases, Mr. Speaker. In fact, there was the Ontario Power Generation before the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada said the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker, rolled back their increases and would not give it to them because of unacceptable costs. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Speaker, I think it's very telling that the minister wouldn't answer the question. I'm going back to the Premier. Before the election, the Premier said she preferred to keep Hydro One in public hands. The Minister of Finance told the Economic Club public ownership is the key. Now the Premier says the public should never have trusted her. She says the public should have understood that weasel words like repurposing assets or lever. That's not acceptable. Withdraw, please. I'm sorry, sir. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. Withdraw. That code words like repurposing assets or leveraging were code for selling Hydro One. And because the public didn't understand the code, she now claims to have a mandate to sell Ontario's oldest and most important public asset. Is the Premier really saying that the 80 per cent of Ontarians who oppose the Hydro One sale only have themselves Question. to blame for trusting her? <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we're talking, about, we're talking about whether or not we had a mandate to proceed. The member has a convenient memory, Mr. Speaker. He forgets around April and May of 2014. We had a budget prepared, a uh, draft budget, but they would not uh, approve. Before the election, Mr. Speaker, we had a budget which indicated very, very clearly. We also had appointed, before the election, Mr. Speaker, the Asset Council. 
and they had a specific mandate, including, Mr. Speaker, looking at repurposing the assets in the energy sector. It was very, very clear, Mr. Speaker. We're proceeding with that, Mr. Speaker. And one of our main issues in that election campaign was providing infrastructure to the people of Ontario, which we're proceeding with. There are two things in the same issue, Mr. Speaker. So the mandate was there, the issue was there, and we're proceeding with it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, my constituents in Halton are worried about the impact of climate change on our environment and our economy. Our region is a collection of local parks, rich farmland, conservation areas, and the escarpment. Organizations like the Halton Environmental Network and the Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation are working tirelessly to keep our riding green and clean. Now, we know the Earth's temperature is rising due to increased greenhouse gases. It's imperative that all governments take action. Action to protect our communities, action to protect the agricultural sector, and action to protect the air we breathe. That's why I was encouraged to see yesterday that we unanimously passed second reading of Bill 9, the Ending Coal Act. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the minister please inform the House about what action Question. the government has taken to eliminate the use of coal in Ontario? Thank you, minister. Thank you, actually, Mr. Speaker. I, I actually want to thank my colleague, the Minister of Energy, present and past, because uh, this was a remarkable leadership by uh, by uh, by the Energy Ministry and our utilities who. Uh, contributed the largest greenhouse gas emissions reduction in uh, in North American history mr. speaker and some people have have suggested that permanently passing legislation to keep this closed is somehow not serious politics in fact mr. speaker two major other OECD countries because of other issues have reintroduced coal so we are actually locking down on something that is very serious building our credibility mr. speaker I want to thank the member from Halton who came to this house as a mom and as a person who's worked in communication who well understands the importance of the environmental issues realizing that these things have to be top of mind mr. speaker I want to thank yes, her for her question thank you supplementary Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, my question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I think we could all agree that reducing coal was a significant step in the fight against climate change. I do find it strange, however, that the federal government, who used to be fiercely critical of ending coal, is now trying to take credit for our leadership on this key issue. We know that action on climate change is vital for the future of our province, and that when it comes to this important fight, there is still more work to be done, but I know we are up to the task. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please inform this House about what other action our government is taking in the fight against climate change? Thank you. Well, sir. Mr. Speaker, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to avoid red tape and regulation that will hurt business. Um, and I, I was interested to hear Mr. Harper yesterday during the debate take credit for our coal reductions, given that he has campaigned against them. He's out there campaigning in British Columbia against uh, Premier Clark's efforts on, on carbon pricing. He's out in campaigning in Alberta against Premier Notley's efforts to reduce carbon. He's here in Ontario complaining about our climate change strategy. He's in Quebec attacking Premier Cuillard's efforts to reduce it. I'm going to ask the minister to refer that uh, to uh, government policy. Speaker, what is he proposing to do? The exact opposite. He said yesterday that he will be proceeding with a sector-by-sector -sector regulatory approach. This is the antithesis of the cap-and-trade systems we're involving. A matter of fact, the Chamber, Ontario Chamber of Commerce came out and said, in contrast to strict regulatory Answer. approach, like the federal government is, is proposing, policies can offer maximum flexibilities. Uh, carbon pricing policies are much preferable Thank you. and offer maximum flexibility. I, uh, I would deeply appreciate all questions and all answers to be relevant to government policy. Uh, when we move over to any other uh, level of government, it's not appropriate in the House during question period. New question, the member from Nipissing. 
Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Public Accounts of Ontario was released yesterday, confirming what we all know. Ontario is the most indebted subnational borrower on the entire planet. But we also had confirmed one other item the Liberals denied for over a year. They sold Ontario, the telecommunications arm of Ontario Northland, for $6 million. We stood in this legislature and said it would actually cost the taxpayers between 50 and 70 million if they went through with this fire sale. And now public accounts has confirmed this, Speaker. They disclosed that the Liberals lost $61 million selling off on Terra. Speaker, how can the how can this government justify this insulting loss to Northern Ontario and this outrageous loss to taxpayers? Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Mr. Speaker, first of all, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, we are very proud, of course, the fact that we made a decision about a year and a half ago to keep four of the five uh, lines of the ONTC in public hands. Uh, the decision to move forward with the uh, uh, the sale of uh, Ontario Telecommunications Wing was a well thought out one, and we very much believe the right one, a necessary step to enable our government to focus strategic investments on the. We were determined to focus on the strategic transportation services that are so crucial to moving forward with a sustainable, long-term, efficient ONTC. And while there were short-term costs associated with the, the sale of Ontario, the costs of continued ownership unquestionably outweighed the short-term costs of the sale. And Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. I can't see how this was well thought out, Speaker. The government took a 100-year-old, $70 million crown asset and gave it away for $6 million. This sounds hauntingly familiar to what they're about to do with Hydro One. But, Speaker, it gets worse. The total doesn't include the lawyers and the consultants who were paid $6.5 million to advise the Liberals. You heard it, Speaker. They were paid $6.5 million to tell the Liberals how, how to sell something for $6 million. They're a laughing stock, Speaker. They bungled the sale. How do the Liberals expect the people to trust them with the sale of Hydro One when they lost $61 million Question. selling a smaller asset like Ontario? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, it's at least a tad ironic that the uh, member asking this question is the one that was calling for the privatization of the Ontario uh, Ontario uh, Northland Transportation Commission. The, the fact is, um, I, can, I can pull the quotes out. Uh, you know, you're not against privatization. We know that well, Mr. Speaker. The, the member knows that, which is why he's been reluctant to ask questions to the legislature. The bottom line, Mr. Speaker, is that we made a decision that is in the best long-term interest of the uh, of the corporation. We will continue to support the ONTC as it transforms its operations and focuses on core transportation services. We worked long and hard to, to make those decisions, working with the municipal advisory committee, and those decisions were to keep four of the five lines in public hands and to move the Ontario into the private sector. Our government remains absolutely committed to ensuring yes, that all communities and industry benefit from a viable, efficient and... Thank you. The member from Windsor to come see come to order. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, it's simply not enough to stand up and say you value our province's teachers and education workers, but continue to ignore them at the table. Members of this House heard this morning from QP education workers who have been without a contract since September 2014 and are still seeking a fair deal. They still don't have one. 
Education workers can clean and repair our schools, make sure that all the proper forms go out and records are kept, and they provide one-on-one -on -one care for students with special needs, a crucial, crucial bridge between these students' complex needs and their educational outcomes. These students deserve to be successful, too. to the bargaining table with our parties in the education system and treat this issue with urgency. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, and uh, I must say that I, I agree with the member opposite on one issue, that we in fact do we do think that coming to agreements with our education workers is urgent and essential. In fact, that's why we have been in negotiations for the last two work weeks, not just with CUPE, which represents many of our education workers, caretakers, maintenance, uh, secretarial clerical, education assistants, early childhood educators, professional student supporters, uh, lunch hour supervisors, all sorts of roles that are quite essential in our province's schools. We've also uh, been negotiating with the uh, Ontario Secondary S uh, School Teachers Federation, which also work, uh, represents a large number of education workers. And it's because we recognize the role that those workers play as being so important to our schools Thank that you. we have been negotiating. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Speaker, we heard this morning how hard, how complex, and how diverse the roles of our education support staff workers are in our schools. But they've been clear in bargaining about what they want, what is best for not only workers but students as well. Not a bottom line, not a final answer, but respect. Speaker, why won't this government get back to bargaining in earnest with elementary teachers and education workers? Why is this government content to create crisis in our schools? Minister. Yes, and I can only repeat that we have been focused on negotiating with our education workers because we respect them, because we value them. So, uh, as, as I said before, we have been uh, negotiating with QP. We're lo looking forward to establishing more dates with QP. Uh, we have been making good progress, and I think that there's real opportunity there for us to come together because QP has been quite clear about what it is they're asking for, and I think that we will be able to come together on our, on our negotiations with that group. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General, Madeleine Mayer. I know that in our province, our justice system uses both official languages, French and English. In my constituency, I sometimes receive comments regarding updates regarding the challenges that people are facing in our judiciary system in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General update us on the activities of by her ministry and the services that we provide for the people of Ontario? The minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague from Glengarry Prescott Russell. I know that he is a proud defender of Frank Coffney and his constituency. So, Mr. Speaker, our government works on several files. We have a great report on access to justice in French by the committee, the advisory committee that was led by Justice Rouleau as well as Paul Lemay, a lawyer, enabled us to bring a strategy to go forward. We put in place a lot of work. We have put in place their recommendations regarding my ministry. That also included the creation of a pilot project that was supported by the Commissioner for uh, Language Services, French Language Services, and we have launched that pilot project in May in the Cor Ottawa Courthouse. Question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Attorney General for her answer. Last Friday was Franco-Ontarian Day in Ontario and was celebrated throughout the province here in Queen's Park with uh, the flag that was raised on our courtesy pole. 
there were lots of Francophones there and I've met with uh, a lot of Francophones in my constituency. I have uh, went to Alexandria and Oxbury to events that were held in these towns and the Attorney General mentioned a recommendation regarding the creation of a pilot project. Could the Attorney General tell us what was the goal, the aim, the scope of this pilot project? The Minister. This pilot project in Ottawa will last one year and its aim is to be spread throughout the province. We already have a project team that should put this, these recommendations and this project in, um, in place and it should start, it uh, actually started in spring 2015. So we, what we want is a more, a better French accent, access, sorry, to uh, this justice system. We want people to be um, aware of their rights in French in our judiciary system. I was in Sudbury last uh, Friday for the flag raising, and it was the 40th anniversary of our Franco-Ontarian flag. I was there with my colleague, the member for Sudbury, and it was really an amazing celebration with a lot of emotions. I would like to thank all of those who celebrated September 25th in their constituency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, today we learned from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce that they've ha they have some very serious concerns about the Liberal cap-and-trade tax scheme, a system that we have yet to hear any details about. The Ontario Chamber specifically mentioned that the government has yet to release any economic analysis of their cap-and-trade tax and that businesses across Ontario remain completely in the dark about plans for revenue and carbon credits. Speaker, what Ontario businesses need is su to succeed is certainty, yet your government, the Liberal government, is rushing into its introduction in time for the Paris photo op. Mr. Speaker, when will the minister listen to the Ontario Chamber and the greater business community and address Question. the concerns outlined in this report? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Thanks, uh, uh, so, Mr. Speaker, I would like to read from the Chamber of Commerce report. It's very insightful. Among strategies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, business prefer market-based approaches that put a price on carbon, such as a cap-and-trade system. In, contract, in contrast to the strict regulatory approach um, that denies business flexibility and innovation. Mr. Harper and your leader stand with the following position. We're proceeding with a sector-by-sector -sector regulatory approach. Mr. Speaker, the Government of Ontario and the Liberal Party stands with business opposed to a job-killing regulatory regime, which Preston Manning and John Charest say will restrain the economy by 3.7 per cent GDP growth. When will the member stand up against Mr. Brown and the member for Simcoe North and Mr. Harper? the Prime Minister of this country and fight the regulations that business doesn't yes, want and work with this government that puts it in business. You see it, please? You see it, please? Uh, order. Supplementary. Yep. I, think, I think we've just... The speaker, we've just seen a new revenue tool for this government. They should be taxing hot air. But back to the Minister. Uh, I'm going to ask for temperate language, please. Thank you, Speaker. The last thing, Speaker, back to the Minister. The last thing Ontario needs is to rush into a system that will cripple business and cost more jobs. In California, the government took seven years to design their program, and in Quebec, it took five years to come up with their tax and cap and trade tax scheme. However, this government is steamrolling ahead with plans to announce Ontario's cap and trade details in just seven months after the 2015 budget. Mr. Speaker, we've seen the legacy of what happens when these Liberals rush into programs. Just look how Sam's turned out for everyone. Ah. Mr. Speaker, businesses Question. need to know what to expect. They need to know how to plan accordingly. Will the minister commit to publicly releasing an economic analysis of the cap and trade you. scheme before Paris? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Listen. 
Mr. Speaker, that's a rather passing strange comment for the member opposite. We've been at this for years. We passed legislation back in 2008 that involved years of consultation. We've been meeting with business on a weekly basis, Mr. Speaker, and we are in the middle of a multi-year consultation that goes on. For the member from Huron Bruce, second time, you ask the question, listen to the answer. So, We've been working with business on a weekly basis, but I'm confused, Mr. Speaker, by the members' offices' questions. Easy to be confused. Business has said they don't want a regulatory sector-by-sector -sector approach, which, which the leader of her party and the Prime Minister believe in. But Preston Manning, Jean Charest, Chris Reagan, the entire Ecofiscal Commission, a matter of fact, Citibank, of the U.S. major study on cap and trade Answer. shows that you would lose 3.7 percent of GDP growth over the next five years yeah. with a cap and trade system. You Thank see you. net new, net new growth, Mr. Thank you. Your question, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is the Premier. Speaker, in the past two weeks. Through media reports, we've learned that you can be a top procurement executive at Infrastructure Ontario, you can admit to procurement fraud, and absolutely nothing will happen to you. In fact, senior executives at Infrastructure Ontario and possibly the board can know about your fraud, and you still get to stay in business. Even the Premier's Chief of Staff can know about your fraud, and instead of being fired, as would be the reasonable approach, you get a promotion and get put in charge of procuring a $300 million patient centre at St. Mike's Hospital. Speaker, will the government commit to a truly independent investigation of this fraud and cover-up and make the findings available to the public? Yeah. Yeah. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. There's a little bit of different information there that the member's sharing with the House that's not exactly accurate, but the fact of the matter is this is a serious matter, Mr. Speaker, and, and a matter that not only does this government take seriously, so do the hospitals that have, uh, have had some association with this individual. All the hospitals involved uh, to date ha are conducting third-party analysis and review of the time that that uh, individual spent uh, in, the, in, their, uh, in their hospitals are working on projects there. We're doing the same prudent and diligent review. In fact, we've hired a forensic accounting firm to look at the transactions the person was involved in. Uh, we've hired a legal firm to look at the, uh, the issues that the, the gentleman was involved in, as well as the uh, issues around yes, his departure. And I've hired a third party as well, Mr. Speaker, advisor, to oversee the process. So I think we're taking the prudent actions we must. Thank you. And I think we'll continue to proceed in that way. Thank you, Speaker. The minister knows that an outsourced investigation is not the same as an independent investigation. We have evidence of a culture within Infrastructure Ontario that tolerates and covers up procurement fraud, but the government has trusted I.O. to investigate its own cover-up. Last December, the Auditor General found that conflict of interest guidelines at Infrastructure Ontario are routinely ignored. The Premier has also stacked the I.O. board with former executives of companies that do business with I.O. Speaker, will this government take this investigation away from, from Infrastructure Ontario and commit to a truly independent public investigation? Or at the very least, will they invite the OPP to set up a permanent detachment here at Queen's Park to investigate the never-ending list of scandals that this government is embroiled in? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, unlike the member opposite, we, we actually are taking this very, very seriously. Unlike the member opposite, who seems to want to just uh, just uh, play politics with this, which which I understand, it's the role of the opposition. But, Mr. Speaker, I mean, we've got to keep in mind that the actions of the alleged actions of this individual took place outside of his work at I.O., and the other actions that we're talking about took place after this individual left I.O., which leaves us to the question. Was there anything untoward, or was there anything, any anomalies that took place during his time at I.O.? And that's why we've hired a forensic uh, accounting firm to take a look to see if there are any anomalies. That's why we've brought in independent legal advice to do the same thing. And that's why I've brought in an independent advisor to oversee the process to ensure that the public interest is protected. I think that's the right actions to take at this time. I Answer. think it's being very prudent. We're taking the matter seriously, as I know really the member is. Is, and I think we're doing what we ought to be doing at this stage. Thank you. Here, here. The member from Republic of Lakeshore. 
Mr. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, this House has been debating the Smart Growth for Our Communities Act, which proposes important changes to the Planning Act and the Development Charges Act. Uh, the Minister and other colleagues are aware that before coming to Queen's Park, I was a City Councillor, Chair of Toronto's Planning Committee, and my driving passion in elected office has been urban planning, city building, and now province building. For this reason, I'm delighted to be part of a government that has proposed important changes to both the Planning Act and the Development Charges Act that will improve the processes communities and residents use to determine how their neighbourhoods grow and how to plan and pay for this growth. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the Minister tell this House what motivated these proposed changes and provide a few examples? Question. Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks uh, to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for his long-standing and enthusiastic approach to municipal planning. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaker, Ontarians deserve a predictable, fair and transparent system guiding how their communities will grow. Over the last 18 months, we have consulted widely with stakeholders. We've held more than 20 public workshops, and, and we welcomed over 1,200 mailed-in and electronic submissions. And what did we hear? We heard that Ontarians want to have a greater say in the planning process that shapes their communities. <clears throat> Changes to the Planning Act, if passed, would ensure residents are better consulted on the future of their communities at, at the beginning of the process, so there's less than the late in the game appeals to the Ontario Municipal Board. Also, we'll Answer. encourage more parkland and green space across the provinces. Because of that, municipalities will need to put in place a parks plan. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. Uh, if passed, these changes would make the planning and appeals process more predictable and give more municipalities independence. And This is what residents of Etobicoke Lakeshore and across the province have been asking for. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this legislation proposes changes to the Development Charges Act that will also be critical for smart community growth. And it fits into several related steps put forward by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, as directed by the Premier in her mandate letter to the Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, through you, will the Minister now tell this House how the Smart Growth for Our Communities Act also proposes to change the Development Charges Act, and in addition, what next steps the Minister will undertake in the coming months that will also allow for important changes in municipal planning? Thank you. Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Through you, the changes we propose to the Development Charges Act aim to give municipalities more opportunities to fund growth-related infrastructure like transit and recycling. It would also support curbing urban sprawl in favour of livable, walkable communities that will help to create jobs and grow our economy. And as the Premier instructed in my mandate letter, we will also be reviewing the scope and effectiveness of the Ontario Municipal Board and updating our long-term affordable housing strategy. Both of these parallel projects will contribute to our work in fostering vibrant and complete communities with abundant green space, thriving economies, and a range of housing choices. Mr. Speaker, those future initiatives Answer. will build on the strong foundation we've been busy laying over the last several years. Thank you. And your question, a member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport. Every day, Ontarians see more proof this Liberal government just isn't in it for them anymore. The Premier's office so embroiled in scandal and has set the bar so low on ethical behaviour that even the Toronto Star has had enough. Uh -oh. Meanwhile, this minister rewards well-paid Pan Am Games executives with extravagant bonuses while our home care services are in a shambles. Again, their priorities are out of step with hard-working Ontarians. Where I come from, you don't pay a bonus without proof it was earned. Speaker, if the minister is so confident games executives delivered, why oppose being accountable and transparent by having an independent audit before cutting those checks? Question. Thank you. Minister, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The last time I checked, uh, the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games were the most successful games in the history of this province. And Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Speaker, the member knows opposite that we put together we put together a plan uh, working with TO 2015. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to remind the member opposite that the leader of the opposition, his government was equal partners at the table oh. for TO 2015 when those when those incentives were put in wow. place. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, these were the greatest games that were ever held in Canada. Uh, 217 medals for our athletes. Uh, the uh, Para Pan Am Games were the most successful uh, pa uh, para sport games in the history of this province. We saw an increase in spending right across the GTA and within the 50 municipalities in Toronto. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we saw an 8.8 percent increase in debit card and electronic transfers of spending. Supplementary. Speaker, it's obvious the minister is confused about the issue. We know the athletes perform because we can count the medals and the personal best. We can't do that when it comes to knowing if the games were on budget. Even the Premier admits she doesn't know. So I've made a reasonable request in the interest of transparency and accountability. Tomorrow, my motion asking the Auditor General to audit the Pan Am Games will be debated at the Public Accounts Committee. Speaker, will the minister write to the committee to support my motion, and will he put a freeze on those bonuses here, here. until the auditor can do it? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows that these have been the most transparent games in the history of any sporting event in this country. In fact, when you look around the world and you compare our practices, we've had five technical briefings, Mr. Speaker, uh, many in which the opposition didn't show up to actually get the data. Mr. Speaker, everything was open to FOI, and we've had a lot of those uh, requests come through. These have been very transparent games. Mr. Speaker, we reported a $56 million surplus in infrastructure months ago. And Mr. Speaker, it's only been a month and a bit since these games have been over. We will have a technical briefing, and we have, I believe, I believe we will have some great news to share with the opposition around the success from a financial perspective for these games. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Yesterday, former Justice Stephen Gouge released his review of presidential compensation packages at Western University. The review was conducted because of a double salary payout that legally allowed the President to earn almost a million dollars last year, a payout that Justice Gouge believes should no longer be permitted. Speaker, this is yet another example of this government's failure to rein in executive compensation. In the last few months, Ontarians have learned about a $4 million wage package for the CEO of Hydro One, $1 million salaries for CCAC home care contractors, and $5.7 million in bonuses for Pan Am Games executives. Speaker, will the Question. minister act now to prohibit million-dollar salaries in the post-secondary sector by implementing the private Thank members' you. bill I introduced in April? Speaker, you know, we, we on this side believe that the people of Ontario do have a right to know uh, how compensation is structured for the broader public sector. That's why we introduced the uh, Broader Public Sector Executive Compensation Act. Speaker, It is still a mystery to me why the party opposite did not support that bill. It was one of the more surreal moments in this House, I have to say. But what I can tell you that is this act enables the government to directly control the compensation of designated senior executives in the broader public sector by establishing compensation frameworks. That work is underway now. We are taking a thoughtful and balanced approach to it. We are balancing the, inter the, uh, the interests of the, of the Ontario taxpayers and the need to properly compensate yes, senior executives in our public sector. We have a deferred vote on the motion to closure of the motion to second reading of Bill 73. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
members, please take their seats. All members, please take your seats. On April 21st, 2015, Mr. McMeekin moved second reading of Bill 73, an act to amend the Development Charges Act 1997 and the Planning Act. Mr. Cole has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Cole's motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Mr. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. We are not supporting this. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. Mr. McNeekin has moved second reading of Bill 73, an act to amend the Development uh, Charges Act 1997 and the Planning Act. Is the Pleasure House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, see, please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell. Please take their seats.
Mr. McMeekin has moved second reading of Bill 73, an act to amend the Development Charges Act 1997 and the Planning Act. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. <coughs> Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Chimanta. Ms. Chimanta. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 90 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture, projet de loi. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? The bill is to be ordered for third reading. Referred to a committee. So, <clears throat> there are no further deferred votes. This house stands recessed. 3 p.m. this afternoon.